Entrepreneur Speaker Series. Um, I'm Judy Isles. I'm with our Iowa State's Papa John Center for Entrepreneurship. And we started this program thanks to a very generous gift from Roy and Bobby Ryman 20 years ago, uh, which gives us the opportunity to bring entrepreneurs to campus, typically, to engage with our students and our faculty and our community. And today we're gonna to get to do this online and we have a special guest today. But I first wanna tell you a little bit about Roy Ryman who makes this series possible. Um, Roy is an Iowan, grew up on a farm in Auburn, Iowa and ended up going to Iowa State to receive a degree in ag journalism. At, at 23 years old, Roy Ryman was, was a managing editor for Capper's Farmer Magazine. So quite an accomplishment for someone of his age. He and his wife, Bobby, moved to Milwaukee, and, and that's where in the basement of his home, he started Ryman Publications. Ryman Publications grew to 14 national magazines. Uh, by 2004, more than, eight, more than 16 million people subscribed to his magazines, and one in every eight households in America received at least one of his magazines. So Roy ultimately sold the company, um, retired, but as he will tell you, he flunked retirement and he be, started the magazine, Our Iowa Magazine, here in our state. And he and his wife live in Greendale, Wisconsin, and they've also started Our, our Wisconsin Magazine. Um, his impact at Iowa State has been extraordinary and you can go to many, many places on campus and know that not only Roy and Bobby's gifts have supported Iowa State, um, but Roy is also an extremely entrepreneurial visionary person and has been actively involved in creating many, many things here at our university. You will find his presence obviously at the Ryman Gardens, the Ryman Conservatory, the Christina Ryman Butterfly Wing, also our Alumni Center, um, our Morrill Hall, our Greenlee School of Journalism, um, the Campanile, and uh, many other places where he's had his hands on keeping Iowa State innovative and entrepreneurial. We're happy here at the Papa John Center to be able to offer the Ryman Speaker Series and we also offer a Ryman Internship Program. So today we have a special guest. He's not an Iowa State alum, uh, but connected to one of our Iowa State faculty members. So today, Dr. Rahul Parsa is going to introduce our guest speaker. Um, Dr. Parsa received his PhD from Texas A&M University, but taught at Drake University for 25 years, which is where he met Alex, and has been here at, the, at, the, at, at Iowa State University for nearly six years. Um, Dr. Parsa, you got to have Alex as a student in your class, and that's why we have him here today. So thank you for connecting us to Alex. Um, I've read about Alex, I've watched his company grow, and uh, we're delighted to have him here today. So Dr. Parsa, we'll let you do the introduction. Thanks. Thank you, Judy, and um, thank you, Alex. My God, I was shocked when I saw Alex. He looks just like he was in my class uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, no, no change. And one thing <clears throat> I think every professor dreams of, seeing their students do really well. And I had a lot of good students and Alex is, you know, maybe high about the, you know, like the Mount Everest among all my former students. Um, I have to say one thing at Drake as an AXI professor, we had great students. We were just chatting about another student, Bo Bell and all that, you know. so. But Alex was remarkable um, as a student and what he has accomplished after graduation. The yeah, only way to do it, extraordinary, remarkable. Um, he was a triple major, if I recall right, mathematics, economics, and actuarial science. Then on top of that, he did honors. And uh, one of the funny things was with him, he could not come to my one of my classes. I was teaching this loss models credibility because of this conflict. He could only come one class out of the two. And the other student, just to give him a hard time, used to pick him the hardest problem for him to do. My God, he never, you know, uh, skipped a beat. He did them all. He didn't care, you know, what problem they gave him. And um, I want to acknowledge one other student who used to sit with him. Oh my God, they used to laugh and laugh and laugh with Angie. I hope Angie are there. So 
you know, Alex will say acknowledge to you. I mean, say hi to you as well. So, um, before I uh, give the uh, mic to Alex, let me acknowledge David Spalding, my dean here, College of Business. Uh, another remarkable person, you know. Thanks to Adam. Uh, Alex, that's that's my dean here, David Spalding. Uh, we've done a remarkable job in the college. We just uh, completed a new construction building. Uh, David, do you want to say a couple of minutes, say something? Well, look, th this is a great series. Alex, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking some time with us today. Uh, this is an important series, part of our uh, entrepreneurship programming uh, at Iowa State, which uh, uh, ranked by Princeton Review number 26 in the country, and we're, we're driving for uh, uh, better recognition for the wonderful programs we have in entrepreneurship. But great to have an entrepreneur like Roy Ryman sponsoring a program like this, and wonderful to have a chance to hear from Alex today, and I'm really looking forward to his talk. Thanks, Rahul. Thank you, sir. And Alex, I won't take any more time, and uh, you know, it's all yours. Great, thanks, Dr. Barsa. <clears throat> so, um, you know, first, maybe I should start too by trying to maybe explain a little bit um, about how how I ended up like this, um, which, uh, for better or for worse, um, you know, my my background. Um, I like like Dr. Barsa. First, great to meet everybody. I'm Alex Tim. Please use the chat function. Um, as you have questions along the way. Uh, my background, I, uh, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, uh, and my father was an insurance entrepreneur. He started a company called Century Insurance, uh, and at a very young age, I was really interested in working. And so when I was 14 years old, I actually went to work for my father. Uh, it's actually the first job he gave me, he insured bars and taverns, uh, and the first job he gave me was actually calling uh, bar owners and and telling them when they didn't pay their policy that, that we had to cancel their policy. So it was a rough introduction in the industry. I don't think he wanted me to be an entrepreneur. He wanted me to be, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, take a, an easier path, but it didn't really work. Um, so then I went to, to Drake University to become an actuary, uh, and then uh, Dr. and Dr. Parcel was my advisor, uh, and really fell in love with the profession, fell in love with math. I, I really loved what we were doing. Um, and we also, uh, and, and Drake was a fantastic program, and Dr. Parsa, I tell you, is our best staff professor. So if you guys have a chance to take a course from him, you certainly should. Um, and they're fun, too, which is a rare combination, statistics and fun. Um, but it, it was a really good experience. And uh, after, but after college, I decided to, um, to go and, and work at Nationwide Insurance where I did uh, a variety of jobs. I worked in uh, enterprise risk management, mergers and acquisitions, um, really rotated around the entire company. And while I was there, uh, my, my very last job was actually in corporate strategy. And I remember um, thinking, well, I don't wanna go into that because there's not enough math in it. But um, my job there was really to actually study the insurance industry and say, okay, where are consumers going? Where is technology going? And how do we sort of steer the, steer the ship away from the iceberg? Um, but the problem was that nationwide, we had already hit the iceberg and water was flooding and we just hadn't realized it yet. And so I quickly realized I couldn't actually start what is today root um, within nationwide. And so that's, that's a quick background. I'm gonna go through a deck that sort of explains what root is today. Um, this is a deck that I use, a lot of these slides are just slides that I've actually used while we've raised uh, during raising money and, and, and what we show investors. So uh, I think for, for the, the aspiring entrepreneurs in the room, you know, being able to tell a story and seeing this hopefully will also will help you quite a bit. So first, uh, let me start with then what is Root? Um, you know, Root, we are a new car insurance company that is entirely based on a smartphone. Uh, and we use all of the rich sensor devices within that smartphone to provide insurance um, to consumers at the best rate possible. Um, we started the company in 2015, uh, and since then, you know, we launched in 2016. We're actually the fastest growing company in the country up and through um, 2019, where we did 450 million in revenue. So very, very fast growing company. So 
when you think of insurance uh, and you talk to consumers about insurance, right, they, they really don't like it. They, they, it's hard, right? Consumers feel like it's cumbersome. They don't really know what they're buying, what they're getting. They have no idea how their rates are really calculated. Some people think, you know, uh, maybe it's because I have a red car or a yellow car, which, by the way, none of those are in the rating factors, right? So there's this there's this general opaqueness to it, right? I've never heard a consumer say, oh, you know what I'm doing this weekend? I get to go shopping for car insurance, right? It's generally a product that consumers don't like. And why is that? Well, the first thing is, is you know, if you're like most consumers and you take out your cell phone because in, in Google for insurance to try to purchase insurance, this is what you're faced with. This is actually one of our competitors' apps. Right, and you can see it's just form field after form field that the consumer has to enter in. There's really bizarre questions in here, like you have to figure out if you should get a partnership discount, for instance. Uh, so you have to figure out is your local club or church or whatever it may be, are they on the list and can you qualify for a discount? Just weird things that consumers don't understand while they're asking. And if I actually manage to get through all of these screens, then I finally get the quote, right? Oh, no, actually, I don't. Then I get bombarded with words like, what is your uninsured motorist property damage coverage that you want? What deductible do you want? What total loss? Do you want total loss coverage or not? Uh, do you need an SR-22? It, right? Consumers don't talk like this. Uh, insurance companies talk like this. So now I've gone through all of those screens, and then I'm just bombarded with words that I don't even understand. And if I finally make it through all of that, <clears throat> presumably, I'm just going to get the price. But actually, no, I still don't just get the price, right? I get um, like five different prices, uh, you know, and I know I, I mean, it's a mandatory product. I have to buy this. I know it's important. But how do I know if I need the $1,000 coverage, the $25 coverage? I have no idea. So at this point, consumers are really, really frustrated, really, really confused. Uh, it's kind of amazing in that app with those screenshots I showed you earlier in that app. Um, those were actually my screenshots. And at the end of that process, once I set it all up, it asked me to call an agent. So not surprisingly, this is the result. Uh, this is just actual data unfiltered, right? The first thing, this is what consumers are experiencing when it comes to car insurance, right? They think it's a ripoff, it's too high, the first one's bullshit, right? Uh, they really don't trust this. And that is um, really the problem and why we started Group. You know, the other interesting thing that I saw is, um, you know, if you look at just where the industry is today, you take a step back uh, and you look at, okay, so who's growing and making money? It's really just Geico and Progressive and USAA, which is a bit of a niche carrier, but it's really Geico and Progressive. Everybody else is really struggling to grow and make money. I mean, you have some of the largest companies in the world, like State Farm down here, that are in a turnaround situation. And why is that? Well, it's just because Geico and Progressive got to the internet first. They realized this thing called the internet was going to fundamentally change the way we do business, and they just moved to the mousetrap. And in the meantime, everyone else is trying to figure out what's, uh, you know, what do I do with my agency base? Not only that, but when you look at the pricing models here, so, um, and by the way, sorry, real quick on that last slide too, consumers are still moving. Right? It didn't stop at the internet. Mobile is now the fastest growing retail channel in the country, and not a single carrier is actually using it as a demand generation platform. So it's, there's this huge opportunity. But you combine that, and this, this always amazes some people, you, know, you combine that with the way that, 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 that it's priced, and it's really antiquated. And you look at what we're up against, FICO scores, marital status, age, these are the things that are driving your insurance rate. Right? And in the meantime, though, uh, it turns out through sensor data, we can actually just measure how you're driving. And if I know how you're driving, then I don't need a lot of these correlative factors. And so they're using very old models that are very out of date. And that's why we built Root. We said we were going to build a new insurance carrier and a company uh, based on the mobile phone. So where consumers are today. And by doing business that way, we're going to get this really rich behavioral telematics data off of the phone to better price insurance. We also said we were gonna do it as an insurance carrier, which is sort of a, a, la, a path less traveled, right? Lots of people will tell, might tell you, oh, you should really uh, just start a technology company and sell technology to other companies. That's sort of Silicon Valley wisdom. Uh, you know, that's sort of like what would have happened if Tesla just sold technology into 
<clears throat> to, to Ford, right? Well, those cars would not have been the same. They wouldn't have been able to take the same amount of market share because they wouldn't have controlled their own destiny. Uh, and this is exactly what we felt. So we are mobile first. We're mobile only. We have very high retention. Um, we use all. We then ping the sensors inside the phone over 15 times a second. And we use machine learning and advanced approaches to actually uh, take all of that raw sensor data from within inside that phone and, and turn that into actually really rich insights, right? So I can now take a cell phone and figure out, were you the driver or the passenger during a trip? Were you hard braking? Were you tailgating? Right? We actually ended up being able to do all of that through just all of the smartphone sensors. But we had to use a lot of machine learning to actually, uh, to actually get those insights. And that's led us to better pricing than anyone in the industry. So introducing the product, how it works, essentially a consumer takes their cell phone out of their pocket. They scan their driver's license just by taking a picture. From there, we pull in all of the information that we need. So there's no more form fields matched. All of those screens I showed you before, it's now just a picture of a driver's license. Uh, from there, the consumer drives around for a period of two to four weeks. We gamify it. Um, we show, uh, you know, your driving score, you can earn new points, you can challenge your friends, you can invite your friends, and if they're good drivers, you'll both get a reduction on your premiums. Uh, and then after that period of two to four weeks, if you're a good driver, and only if you're a good driver, we'll actually send you a push notification saying, hey, you can purchase insurance right in the app. Uh, from there, if you push into the app, uh, we give you a quote, we'll match all your prior coverages for you so you don't have to go through and, and think about what bodily injury limits or whatever do I need. If you just want what you currently have, we'll just match it. Uh, and then you can purchase in the app. So you can purchase insurance without ever touching the keyboard. Uh, it's super, super easy and super, super slick. Uh, and then from there, everything is managed within the app. So you can do everything you might need uh, in that app, including file claims. This is something that's interesting that I think is, uh, I didn't appreciate when we started the business, um, but I think as you see more and more data science companies get started, um, this will become a more common narrative. And we are seeing this in other industries too, but there's this real network effect to data science companies. And the reason is, for instance, for, at Root, when we started an insurance company, we had no idea what, um, what price to charge people because we had no data. So you have to basically give your best guess, and then you have to quickly iterate and quickly learn as you go. Um, so that's what we did. Now, uh, as we get more data, you get a better price. Because as we get better at pricing, then we can grow faster and be more profitable, meaning we can reinvest back in our growth. And so this flywheel really started to spin for us in 2018, where uh, basically as you collect data, your price gets better. As your price gets better, you can grow faster. As you can grow faster, you can collect more data. So the success kind of starts the flywheel spinning and just the sheer quantities of data that you have. And as that grows, turns out you can do a lot more things with it. And this sort of is a testament to this. Um, you know, when we started, like I said, we didn't really have any data. And our first version of our model was about four times as predictive as the leading industry vendor. Uh, and then since then, we now are over 10 times as predictive. And this is basically just our ability to predict auto insurance accidents. In addition, uh, and all of that has, this is a little technical uh, and more financial, but all of that has really led to just this big improvement also throughout the business. And so a uh, larger percentage of our book is actually returning customers. You know, So we're building that returning customer base. That's something that's very, very important. And we've seen our loss ratios consistently come down in that second period, meaning that's our profit. And like I said, our growth is honestly uh, unprecedented. The company has grown <clears throat> revenues as fast as Google did in the early days, Apple did in the early days, Netflix did in the early days. Uh, and that's really a testament to again meeting those consumers where they are. So lastly, and then I think we can make this more conversational and, and take some questions, you know, why will we root win? You know, when we think about the future, we think about um, well, one, we're, we're a full stack insurance carrier, meaning we completely control our own destiny. Uh, we're still only in 30 states. We're going to be in 50 states probably by the end of this year, um, which obviously is a huge upside. We actually have the largest database of anybody of mobile data actually tied to claims data. 
uh, and then uh, you know we continue to focus on technology and the customer. So that's at a high level who Groot is. Um, I gave a little bit of my background, uh, but I think now maybe we can open it up for a little bit of Q&A. Thanks, Alex. And so if you have questions, go ahead and submit them through the chat function at the bottom of your screen, and we will get those answered. And I actually, um, I have a question to start, Alex. I think of some of the traditional insurance companies that offer these bundles. Are you seeing people convert from their traditional insurance to Root, or are your best customers those that are first-time auto buyers? Where, where are your customers coming from? Yeah, that's a good question. Our customers are coming primarily from Geico and Progressive. Um, so you're right, lots of people bundle. Um, we actually do sell renter's insurance and now home insurance on the platform as well. So you can get that bundling discount. It's not as meaningful to a lot of folks, um, but some folks that want that, we, we, can, we can provide that. So I think somebody asked us how we, how we process insurance claims. It's actually all, all of those claims are actually managed through the app. Um, so over, about 75% of our claims come in through the app entirely. Um, we can then take pictures of the scene. We use machine learning algorithms actually to estimate, to generate an estimate of how much we think that we should pay out for that claim. Uh, and then it, that, that offer goes to the consumer in the app. If they like the offer, they can accept. If they don't, they can actually call into one of our claims associates and talk to them if they want to, uh, but they don't have to. Uh, and then from there, uh, you know, we adjudicate the claim, but it's all handled in-house. Alex, I don't know if you're seeing the seeing the questions come through or not, but um, we can kind of read them out loud for anybody who's not watching, um, and they're they're coming through fast. So, uh, question from Amir: How do you process insurance claims? If you have yes, that's that. the one I think I just just okay. answered. So maybe the next one: What was your biggest challenge in the early stages of the business? Um, so it's interesting. When, when I quit Nationwide, I just had this idea. And all I did was have a deck, a presentation, like what I just gave you guys, quite frankly, um, and a spreadsheet that showed how this business could look at scale for basically a financial model. Um, and I went to a venture capital firm, and I pitched. I just asked them if I could pitch to the, to the partnership. Um, I pitched to the partnership, and um, they said, yeah, we want to fund you. And I honestly, I almost fell out of my chair um, because I thought, no way, you just like present and then they're gonna, you know, fund you with five million bucks. It just kind of seemed incredible. Um, but, and at that point it was, well, you know, I, I actually thought, well, you know, most of these things fail, but I can't not try. Um, and so I decided to, uh, that, that was part of the reason why I started. But, so for me, the interesting thing was is raising money was not the hard part. The hardest part and the biggest challenges I have is really figuring out that founding team. So, um, you know, I made a lot of mistakes early on and had to get rid of a lot of people early on, quite frankly, um, because they didn't work out. Um, and honestly, I think I, the first five hires that I made at Root, I had to completely get rid of and almost start again. Um, and because it turns out when you raise $5 million from the venture capital firm and you tell people about it, lots of people want to come in and work there, uh, maybe not for the best reasons. So um, ended up the, then I met my co-founder, Dan Mangus, who's an engineer, um, and started a company called Braintree. And, I, uh, and him and I got along very, very well. So we ended up uh, uh, starting a company and then things have been much easier since then. Do we want to take these in order? I'm sorry, I think you're, you're, you're muted. Yeah, if you're just willing to read through and respond, that's great. Okay, perfect. Looks like we're um, at Kyle. So how are we different than um, Snapshot at Progressive? So this is a great question. So Snapshot at Progressive, there's a couple of things. Um, there's several things, actually. But Progressive actually didn't build Snapshot, the, the Snapshot app. They actually partnered with a company called TrueMotion. And this was something I was experiencing at Nationwide and Corporate Strategy before I finally quit. Uh, and this was the idea that well, we'll just partner with tech companies and then everything will work out fine. The problem with that is, and this is sort of why we started as an insurance carrier that I alluded to earlier, is you don't control then the whole product flow. 
Um, and so right now, Progressive has this partner over here that's sort of making their snapshot app, and then they're they're the they're the back end. So there's a whole bunch of problems with this. One, they don't they don't really control the price. Progressive controls the price. And one thing that Progressive is not willing to do and has never been willing to do with their telematics program is actually kick out bad drivers. And when you look at this data, it's really peaked. The worst driver is roughly three to four times as likely to get into an accident as the average driver. So, you know, when you drive down the road and you see that guy cutting in and out of traffic and you say that jerk's going to cause an accident, you're right, that jerk is going to cause an accident and we're measuring that. However, we're the only company in the country that is taking those folks and just not selling them insurance. Uh, and Progressive and uh, is, for instance, is, is writing everybody. Uh, and they're not surcharging those people. They're not charging them three to four X what they should be paid, which means they can't discount the good drivers to the extent we can. They can't afford to. If you don't charge the bad drivers what you should, you can't afford to discount the good drivers to where you should. Um, and why is that? Well, this is an interesting thing, and I would highly recommend the book Innovator's Dilemma to anybody who's really interested in being an entrepreneur. It's by Clay Christensen, who um, just passed away not too long ago, but was a professor at Harvard Business School for quite a while. Um, and th it, there's a real innovator's dilemma in this space where a new variable, if I'm progressive and I suddenly say, oh, I want to charge like group, well, what happens? I take all of these bad drivers, I charge them a ton, I take everybody else, I reduce their rates. Well, everybody I, I just increase rates on, they all leave me. Everybody else that's still there, I just charge significantly less. I shrink my business by, by about half. So there's this huge innovator's dilemma of I don't want to disrupt my existing customer base. Um, and, you know, a theory of good management is that you listen to your customers, that you go to your customers and ask them what they want. Um, right? And, and, and they clearly aren't going to tell you that this is what they want. Um, so it's, it's a time where good, you know, good management principles of listening to your customer doesn't actually lead to the right answer, which is pretty, un, you know, unconventional. So I think the next one is uh, what unique risks are present um, with a constantly changing book of business and how are you working to manage growing while also being profitable? Well, there's two ways uh, that we look at this. One, there is a lot of risk, and the way that we manage that risk is really through capital. And so we've raised, um, we've now raised, God, with debt and everything involved, we've probably raised about a billion dollars. Um, so we have now a large balance sheet. So as those risks come in, we can still do that. You know, the other thing is profit. When we think about profitability, um, and this is something that I think every entrepreneur has to figure out for themselves, what kind of company do you want to build? Um, you know, when we started this company, we said, we're going to swing big. We're going to go for it. Which, by the way, very well suited for venture capital. So we said, we're going to build a historic company. We're going to go in and try to build as, take as much market share as we possibly can, because we think the next Amazon, the next lasting enduring company can be built in this sector, right? It's a giant sector. It's a $266 billion sector, just in auto. So if we take 10% market share of a $26 billion company, right? So we said, that's what, that's it. We're going for it. Um, now, that also means, though, that you're not going to uh, sort of value your near-term profitability nearly as much. You're not going to say, oh, every quarter I want to make money because you've got to keep investing in things like engineering, like data science, like new algorithms. Your R&D costs are huge. Um, so that's really what we've done. Again, we manage, we, we always have enough capital to manage that runway, and you always have to be very conscious of the runway. You know, in the early days, we didn't have enough capital. And really, the way that I was handling it in the early days, you know, when we raised $5 million, right, there's a big difference between the $5 million that I first raised to the billion that we now have. Um, and you stair step your way there. But the way you do that is you take one big technical problem that you think is really worth like mentioning if you solve it. You solve it, and then you go to investors again and say, hey, look, I solved this. I've got more proof as in the pudding. Give me a bigger check. And then you do it again and again and again. Um, and that's really how you manage the risk in one of these businesses. So um, somebody asked, uh, oh, Dr. Parts asked, can I, uh, the business education help me in my career? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one, I think, being an actuary and studying statistics and math, that clearly made me realize, you know, even early on uh, you know, when machine learning was really a thing. Actually, in our curriculum, we didn't study that. We studied more classical models. Um, but as analytics began, and because this was 10 years, 
this was more than 10 years ago. Um, you know, as, as that though sort of progressed and this new technology called machine learning started to be more applicable and usable, I was able to read the textbooks and read those things and actually understand what was going on. Um, so that's really, really important to have, in my mind, a very solid technical background. Um, you know, the other thing I'll say that I, you know, a lot of people ask, like, how did my education as an actuary impact things too? I tend to look for things, and Dr. Parsa will know this term, but I always say I like leptoperitosis. Um, so things with big, fat, right tails and no, and actually, I don't know if Dr. Parsa still has a shirt, but he used to have a shirt that said, fat tails bad, and it was in risk management. Um, but um, basically, looking for, I don't look at my decisions as a deterministic decision, like I'm going to make this decision, and this is absolutely what's going to happen. I look at decisions as, and I look for decisions where there's a huge upside if I'm right. And if I'm wrong, it's not going to kill me. That's kind of actually how I looked at starting a company. Huge upside for me personally if I'm right, and it turns out this mobile thing is going to be really big for insurance. If I'm wrong, I can go back and work at nationwide. Um, and you know, those were sort of the things that, that really educated me. And I think that decision-making process was actually from that. Um, and then lastly, I'll just also say, like, I think a general business education is, is very, very helpful because you can understand a little bit more about just some of the lingo and the words and things like that that people throw around. So how are Geico and Progressive responding to your challenge and unique value props? Um, so Geico really isn't responding very much at all. Uh, it's interesting. They actually don't have a really big telematics program like what we're talking about to speak of, so they're not even really collecting this data. Progressive made a really strong push at this, and they really tried, and um, they never were able to get it right, and it's because of that innovator's dilemma we talked about where they were never actually aggressively discounting and leveraging this data because they didn't want to disrupt their existing book, um, and what we saw was they sort of tried to do some look-alike things, like with Snapshot, like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll launch it. We're not gonna do the exact same, but you know, we'll launch it and say we have it. Um, well, not surprisingly, then it never took off because they didn't actually make it a priority. And what we're really seeing, and this is also an advantage that you can have as an entrepreneur, is you can take very long-term perspectives. You can say, I'm not gonna worry about my next quarterly performance. I'm gonna worry about performance in the next 10 years. You can even do that with the public markets if you educate them correctly. Um, and that's a huge competitive advantage because you look at most of these management teams and they're all compensated based on their quarterly or annual performance. Um, so, uh, you know, progressive is not incented, their CEOs is not incented to go invest heavily in data science and engineering. What are they, they're incented to really just try to maximize profit over the next 90 days. So what we're actually seeing them do is, is quite different, very, very different things than really trying to um, sort of disrupt themselves, right? If you're those two guys, I showed you that chart where they're upper right corner. They don't think auto insurance is broken. It's going great for them. Um, they're thinking, well, how do I now go into home insurance and get a piece of that pie? Um, so it's interesting because you haven't seen the competitive response near to the degree we thought. It's not just because of the innovators dilemma and business model and technology issues. It's also just because there's a true incentive issue. What's your suggestion to uh, students coming out of university and want to pursue entrepreneurship? So I think what the biggest thing is you're never going to know when you're ready. Um, I didn't feel ready when uh, Drive Capital wrote us that first check. I thought for sure I wasn't ready. Um, then you realize you just kind of have to go for it. Um, and you really just have to put your back into it because that's the only way you're going to learn. Um, and so my advice um, for anybody that really wants to go start a company um, is one, make sure it's an idea that like keeps you up at night. Like it should be such a good idea that when you hear it, you're like, oh man, that's like an inevitability. That's the direction the world is going. And like, I just got to be a part of it. And if you have that piece, then I think the next step is go for it. And like, don't wait, um, just try. And that means if you need money, that means go pitch, go get in front of venture capital firms. You can, you can, you can call venture capital firms in, in, in Iowa, right? You can cold call or, 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 or in the Bay Area. You can cold call anybody. So just go for it and totally get out of your shell and do it, is what I would say, because you're never going to feel prepared. Uh, question, um, how has COVID changed or impacted your business? 
it's been interesting. It's actually really accelerated our business. You almost feel guilty saying this, but it's been a good thing for us. Um, uh, net positive for us financially. Uh, and that's because, um, yeah, we, you know, we did the, we did discount because we obviously collect driving data. So we did do discounts back to our policyholders. But the other thing that happened and really what was positive for us is not just the reduction in driving. The big benefit to us was that there were a lot of people that were no longer going into insurance agents and were getting pushed online that previously would have gone into an insurance agent. And so it really accelerated a lot of the digital trends that we're seeing. Uh, the next question is, can you talk about what information you collect and how you process the huge amount of information that you have? How did technology help you gain an edge? Yeah, and that's that was a, a really difficult problem. It still kind of is, actually. Um, I mean, the way the process, the pure processing and computing power you need is pretty amazing for this stuff. So cloud computing was something that certainly needed, and distributed processing was something that certainly needed to exist prior to really existing. Um, so we do, we collect, like I said, if you're driving, we're collecting around 15, we're collecting a few hundred data points, uh, about 15 times a second on our, on you, um, and millions of people on the platform. So that obviously is a ton, ton of data. So what you have, what we've done is we've actually hired lots of very smart data scientists and engineers to figure out how do you, there's certain programs, Hadoop being one of them, that allows you sort of to break up and distribute your database and then run algorithms across them. Um, so that was, that was pivotal. Uh, what should, or what suggestions do you have for choosing a business, uh, a business partner? Um, so this is a good one because I did it wrong. I had, I, you know, I had two business partners originally and didn't work out. And I have one now that actually worked out. So I've sort of done it both ways. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, really make sure their integrity bar is really, really high. And if you have any doubts about that at all in the early days, don't rush into it. Just wait. Um, it's really, really, really rough when you get into a business venture and you know, you've already got the whole world fighting you because the world doesn't like change to then be there with somebody that you can't trust. Um, once you find that high level of trust, make sure you also have that that person also has a high level of competence in whatever they're doing that you believe it matches yours. Um, and so, um, make sure that they also are bringing those skills to the table because I also found some business partners that were great uh, friends, but friends should not be your business partner. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes startups make, right? And they get these like fraternity cultures because of it. Um, and it's, it's really not productive. Um, and, and what you really quickly realize is that um, you live and die by your business results, not necessarily anything else. And they can, and you're, you're setting yourself up for something really difficult usually if you do it just with a buddy. Um, so make sure there's there's substance to it from a business perspective, and then make sure that person has integrity beyond anything. Uh, you mentioned using the phone sensor data in your risk pricing models as opposed to traditional demographic and credit scoring model features. Anything else you think about your approach with uh, predictive analytics that you'd be willing to share? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so not only are we leaning away from and by the way there's a very big um, social benefit here too right when you look at car insurance and the way that it's it's priced it's essentially a tax on the poor um and i noticed that at nationwide too which is also part of the thing that didn't feel great right we're basically taking the folks who can least afford it and charging them the most and taking the folks who can most afford it and charging them the least this was a way to actually give power back to the consumer Say, listen, I'm not going to judge you by your zip code, your age, any of those things, or your credit score, your occupation and education are one of them, uh, which Root doesn't use at all. Um, but we actually give power back to those consumers and say, but if you're doing things that, by the way, society wants you to do, like you're not texting and driving, which quite frankly, quite literally saves lives, will allow you to get a better rate on car insurance, which to us was really big because, um, you know, car insurance is such a massive system that is required by law. Um, and so if you want a job and you gotta drive to that job, you've gotta buy this. And so we do believe we've created a more fair system. Um, 
the other thing I will say that's in interesting about our analytics approach is we, uh, you know, if you look at most insurance companies, maybe they'll change rates once every six months, maybe once a year. Um, we're moving very, very quickly. We, we can change rates and we, we ship new um, algorithms uh, multiple times a week. Uh, and the reason we do that is because we're set up as a tech company. If you look at Root, it doesn't look like an insurance company. We have lots of PhDs and data scientists and lots of engineers that are constantly working on how they are refining those models. Also, almost all of our models are machine learning based. So we don't really have a lot of the classical statistical models. You don't really find a lot of GLMs floating around Root. And so um, that's another thing that, that really does differentiate um, sort of what we're doing. Has another company tried to buy us out? Yes, <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, but again, we kind of said we were going for it in the beginning. And so those small dollars really didn't entice us because it wasn't about the money and it wasn't about, um, it was just about the mission of, we really think we could get this thing out there and change and, and build a historic company. And so when we got those offers, it was always um, more about the future uh, and what we could build. Um, which is, is always an interesting conversation. What are you curious about and what keeps me curious? Personally or within the company? You know, I think I genuinely am curious about um, a lot of different technologies. Um, I'm still, you know, we are very leaned in right now to autonomous vehicles and we have an autonomous vehicle department that actually writes code for autonomous vehicle manufacturers um, and helps them with, because it's a lot of that is machine learning based as well. Um, and I'm really fascinated in how that technology continues to evolve. Um, you know, the other thing I'm also really curious about too is consumers longer term. Uh, I think right now with a lot of what's going on nationally in terms of social injustices um, and other things, uh, the political scene, it's really got people up in arms, obviously. And I wonder how lasting these are and, if are, and is the consumer mentality and behavior actually going to change? Are they actually gonna care about, for instance, a company like Root that prioritizes fairness? Um, or are they still, or, or are we gonna slip back into our own behaviors? I think you know, there's been this general theory that consumers will become more socially conscious over time, um, but I'm not sure we've necessarily seen that stick. Um, and so I am genuinely curious about that as well. But I'm, in, I'm naturally very curious. So like, I'm also curious about like every part of our business. I have a direct report who said, um, Alex's problem isn't that he loves his job, it's that he loves everyone's job. Um, so <laughs> sometimes I can get a little in the weeds. Ah, how, do I apply, how do we apply the data to homeowners and renters? So this is really fascinating. Two, two different, well, two very different insurance products. Renters insurance, primarily the reason you buy renters insurance is not for your TV. It's because if you throw a party or something, it covers your personal liability. So let's say you throw a party, somebody falls off the balcony, they sue you, your renters insurance company is gonna be the one to actually step in and, and help defend you in court. Um, so the interesting thing about renters insurance is what we've actually found is that a lot of this mobile data and how you drive and texting, texting and driving particularly, is highly correlated with responsibility, general responsibility. So people who are really safe drivers and conservative drivers also tend to have very a much lower personal liability risk. And so we can, if you pass that driving test, you do get a better actually uh, uh, discount on, on renters. Now on homeowners, we're still doing a lot of R&D on that front um, because we're actually ensuring the structure. And so you have to think like, is it gonna burn down? Is a hurricane gonna hit it? And it's different by geographic region in the United States. Um, but what we've done currently is we've actually got aerial imagery right now from satellites, and we've been able to better predict which roofs are actually going to leak and bad things happen to uh, uh, when, a, when a new storm does come. And, and, the, and the homeowners is interesting too, because it turns out most people on home want to proactively fix these things. So if I tell you, you have a big hole in your roof and you just don't know about it, because when's the last time you were on your roof? Um, you typically want to go fix it. 
Um, so it's interesting because so what we've been able to do is actually we'll sell somebody a home policy, we'll fly a drone over their house and we'll say, hey, by the way, this looks like a big risk to you, you should go fix it. And they do. Um, you know, that's a little different than some of the other lines of business. Um, so the next question is, um, in my experience, what would I suggest a small start a startup to focus on and drive more sales? Um, the first thing is the product. So um, when you are small, when you're five people, right, all we did. So first off, when we launched Root, there, it, there's no such thing. We should just dispel this myth. I think Silicon Valley likes to tell this myth. There, I have never met a founder who said, oh, yeah, I just shipped the product, and then everybody came and bought it. It just went crazy overnight. It didn't, right? You had to have a distribution strategy. You had to iterate on that product to figure out what consumers actually wanted. Uh, and I don't think it, it's kind of a disservice to entrepreneurs everywhere because you're going to launch a product and you're going to be very disappointed because no one's going to use it. And that's exactly what happened at Root. So the things that I would recommend doing, one, paying very close attention to what are your consumers actually doing with your product. Um, so for us, for instance, when we launched um, the ability to automatically cancel your prior coverage cancellation and just um, move you right over to root, it doubled our conversion rate, right? Something that simple, because what we found out was that consumers really don't like calling Geico or Progressive and telling them that they're leaving. And not because of the phone call, by the way, it was a hassle, but because they didn't want to have a rough conversation where they felt like they were firing somebody, right? Because people don't like to fire people. And that was a very early insight. I got that because I was calling all of the customers. Um, so do things that don't scale in the beginning. Um, also go and, you know, go door to door, do things like, don't worry about getting a million customers, get 10 customers this week. If you, and if that sounds unreasonable, then go get five. And then next week, see if you can do six. And the week after that, see if you can do seven and just continue that 10% growth rate. And it turns out you'll build a big company over time. And don't worry about if what you're doing is going to scale to a million customers when you're in that early stage, just get customers. Where do I see the insurance industry going in the next five and 10 years? You know, I think the industry right now, it's archaic. It's probably one of the largest industries on earth that has not been disrupted. Uh, you know, the average age of our competitors is over 100 years old. So I think it's massively ripe for disruption. I think you will see some of the incumbents pivot out of some of these spaces um, that are going to be more competitive, like personal lines. And I think you'll see guys from Progressive, they'll still try to innovate and they're still good companies, they're just different companies. Uh, but I do think you'll see new market entrants gain meaningful market share over time. Do I see any, oh, Angie asked, do I see any opportunity to move into the commercial space and have you identified any data that could be used to rate on those types of policies, commercial auto uh, or general liability? Right now, we haven't looked at the commercial space very much. Um, there, it, it actually came up with a lot of the autonomous work we're doing because autonomous truck manufacturers are having a difficult time getting insurance at a reasonable cost on their fleets, even though they're not crashing very often. And since we have all of that data, they asked us to do it. We haven't really pulled the trigger on it, though, and we aren't really leaning that far into it. Oh, God. How many hours was I working per week when I started a company compared to now? Uh, do I find it hard to find a work-life balance? Um, yeah, when I started the company, I was working like 100 hour weeks. Um, now, and then now it sort of ebbs and flows. I would say an average week for me is probably 70 to 80 hours. Um, you know, good weeks. So there, there, there have been periods where it's been 40 hours, uh, 50 hours. Um, but in those early days, it's really, really rough. It's really hard. Uh, but I will say too, you, you know, I don't want to, it's not my goal to work a whole bunch of hours all of the time. Like when you're working too many hours, something's wrong. Um, and usually, and at the beginning, everything's wrong. And that's, you, know, you should just expect that as a startup. Um, but you, it's, it's actually the hyper growth that causes really, really crazy hours. Not necessarily the very beginning where you're just, because there's not that much to do in the beginning, right? Half the time you're sitting there waiting for someone to call you back and like, you know, you're, kind of feel like your company's dying while this person's just waiting to call you back uh, because there's just not that much stuff there. But once that growth really kicks in and it starts to get really rapid, that's really when a lot of the hours can run you exhausted. And what you have to do is you have to figure out that a big part of your job is actually recruiting your team. 
Um, and that is, that's how you get out of that, right? Um, so if you're doing too much and you're doing everything um, and the business is going really well, it's time to invest in actually recruiting. Uh, and then in general on work-life balance, how do I, I balance it? Um, you know, I wouldn't say I have a silver bullet for any of you there. I think it's difficult. I think when you love what you do and you have a supportive um, system around you that wants to support you uh, and understands your drives and desires and really appreciates who you are and, is there, and are there for you, that makes it a lot easier. How do I get consumers when we just had started? Um, how do we get our first customers and convince them that something so cumbersome had been simplified to a mobile app and it wasn't a scam? Yeah, the scam thing we got a lot in the early days. People said, oh, heck no, you're just going to sell my data. Um, you know, it started off um, slow and we didn't try to make everyone our customer. Um, so in the very early days, right when we launched the product, we were really focused on young males in urban areas and really actually just Columbus, Ohio. And so we went and I remember we said, hey, you know, do we think we can go? For instance, we went to this place called the North Market, um, which is like a, a lunch place in Columbus. And we went and we set up a stand and we actually just went talking to people and asked them to try the product. Um, and then we'd get their information and we'd call them later. Um, so again, we were doing things that really didn't scale. And then slowly what we started to do is we started to experiment with some marketing dollars. Once we actually had those marketing dollars and we were confident that the product would perform because of our early customers. And then that's when we started to do things that actually naturally started to scale. So um, yeah, it was a lot of boots on the ground. Yes, I do believe the product is available in Iowa, somebody just asked. Um, as you've grown, how have you learned to allocate your time to keep up with the advancements in technology versus industry versus business strategy versus everything else? Um, your time is something that's super valuable, especially as you grow. And you know, we've got about 1,000 employees now, um, which has grown considerably. We, you know, I think a year ago, we were at maybe 500. So it's growing pretty quickly still. And what that does is it becomes a huge time suck on your time because everybody wants to talk to you. Everybody wants to report to the CEO. Um, and what you have to do is be really, really deliberate and ask what I do is I ask myself, uh, and I actually write it down once a month, what would the best CEO of Root be? Not me, I don't want to tie myself to it, but what would the best CEO of Root do for the company? And what are those big areas? What would they be achieving and where would they be spending their time? And then I compare that to what I'm actually doing. Um, and that's when you really have to start to cross things off um, and say, you know what, I'm not doing this. I will tell you, during normal times, I, I block two hours every day, 8 to 10 a.m., just to read. Um, and that's really, it can be anything. It could be materials from my team, a write up from my team. It could be an industry paper. It could be something new on technology. Um, but I've always found that to be super important. What are some areas of your favorite resources to stay up to date on topics in data analytics, good books, podcasts, et cetera? Um, so I don't know if you guys do archive. Um, uh, .org, but basically it's free um, free papers, uh, free white papers, and there's a ton of really good machine learning ones out there. Um, and you can look at the most popular papers, and I will actually go through and I'll find a few white papers that I like at least once a week. Um, during that 8 to 10 a.m. time slot, I'll sort of plug in there. The other thing that's really cool, just because we've been, now we're bigger, uh, is I have these like PhDs that work for me, and I can like, like hey, I want to know everything about this, and I can sit down and it's like a free lesson. Um, which is great. I mean, you know, Dr. Parsi used to charge for them, but now, now they're free for me. <laughs> I think that's all of the questions we have, Judy. Alex, did you, or I mean, yeah, two Alexes. Alex Andrade had asked a question about if you had one redo, what would it be? If you could go back and do one redo. I don't think you answered that one, did, did you? No, I didn't. Um, In the early days, I would have invested more in some of the backing components and not have pushed growth as aggressively. Think when you're really, really early on, you're so growth focused and obsessed, which you have to be to a certain degree, especially super early. 
But very quickly after, I think what I would have done is not push so maniacally hard, and I actually would have um, allowed the organization to breathe a little bit, and I would have moved slower. I was pushing too hard and too fast. And it almost broke some people and some processes. Hey, Alex, a quick thing. Um, are you going to say, or you sound like, maybe, is the actual education, the exams and all that, you know, FCAS and the, I think they're outdated compared to what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, it's totally outdated. Okay, I'll, I'll tell Stuart that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, one last thing, uh, you think we can do the same thing in uh, life and health kind of data? I don't know enough about it, but I definitely think there is new data fields that will definitely be more predictive. I think wearables is, a, is probably a big one where you know the, the watch can figure out if you are if you run or not and those sorts of things. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's all going to change for sure. I just don't know enough about life and health to tell you exactly you know, where it could. Mm -hmm. So we do have just a couple minutes. Um, I'm going to ask you for one more thing. And then I just for everybody listening, um, I stuck an email address in the chat. So if you have specific thanks you want to share with Alex, uh, follow up questions, information, um, or if you want to send a note, which I encourage you to do so to Roy and Bobby Ryman, you can send that to info at isupjcenter.org and we will make sure those uh, comments and questions um, or thanks get passed along. Um, Alex, one final question I have. Um, we have a number of students here at the university. They love entrepreneurship. They love innovation. Um, many of them don't really know what they want to do, but they just have this passion and interest. Um, how, how do they explore that? How do they tap their inner entrepreneurial um, interests? And what advice would you give students about how to continue to learn and, and, and be entrepreneurial? Yeah, absolutely. That is a good question. Um, you know, first and foremost, I would say definitely take computer science courses. Um, the second thing I would say is, um, you know, then get out. Honestly, like the Bay Area is pretty amazing. If you have an opportunity to get out to the Bay Area, and especially if you and, and do some internships at some of those startups, and getting just into the community it doesn't have to be in the Bay Area; it can be a startup anywhere. But really, getting involved in the community and getting an internship or doing something with that startup in the startup environment. Um, you'll find a lot of like-minded people who are really passionate about big ideas too. And I think that's often where you can figure out what exactly are you passionate about. Great. We are down, I think, to the last minute. And if somebody has one final burning question they'd like to ask, um, you have one minute to do so. You can put it in chat or unmute yourself and ask away. Nobody's jumping. You must have answered everybody's <laughs> answers about uh, entrepreneurship in the insurance industry. Alex, we would like to thank you for joining us today. I know, I know from working with Nicole how extremely busy your calendar is right now. Um, and it's probably great that we're in COVID and we could have you join virtually because the trip may not have happened otherwise. So thank you for being with us today. Our thanks to Roy and Bobby Ryman for making this series possible. And to all of you listening, answering questions, ask, asking questions, um, thanks for joining us today for the Papa John Center's Ryman Entrepreneur Speaker Series. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Dr. Barsa, Angie, good to see you again as well. Oh, okay. So you noticed Angie there. Okay, she was there. She yeah. asked you a question. Yes. Yeah. Hey, guys. Thanks, so, thanks, thanks, Alex. Yeah, let me know when you can chat. Dr. Parsa, thanks for bringing Alex on. Yeah, thanks for oh, all. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Oh, God, he's wonderful. He looks the same. I tell you, oh, my God. You know, the.